With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. On Sunday mornings, I've been preaching through the book of Hebrews, verse by verse. And on Sunday evenings, we're working through the Old Testament book of Judges. But last month, we started once again a month-long church-wide memory verse emphasis. Several years ago, I sat down in my own prayer time as well as with our ministerial staff, and we identified 48 key verses of Scripture. These 48 verses cover what we might call the whole gamut of Christian discipleship. Verses on the gospel, verses on evangelism, verses on Christian stewardship, about prayer, about what we believe about the Bible, including Psalm 119 verse 11, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And what we want to do is take these 48 verses over a period of four years And on the first Sunday morning of each month, God willing, I just want to preach on or around that verse and then take the entire month to commit that passage to memory and to put it into practice. We completed that four-year study about a year ago, took a year off from it, and we've recently restarted this 48-month emphasis. Five years ago, actually, this month, I preached from this very passage. But I believe it is something that we need to write on our hearts on a regular basis. That I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. This one verse would handle a lot of the false, flawed, fallen ideologies and philosophies in the American church. This one verse would be a death nail to the idea of evolution. For we did not evolve by some cosmic collision from pond scum or some previous primate form. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. This one verse would be an end to abortion and other types of murder and infanticide. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. This one verse of Scripture would be an end to racism, to bullying, and other forms of bigotry. For we could say this of every person ever conceived in the womb of their mother, Whether they look like us, act like us, live where we live, think like we think, behave like we behave, or dress like we dress, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Psalm 139 is a great doctrinal treatise penned by King David, the same David that killed Goliath and was the greatest earthly king that ever sat on the throne of Israel. You'll note in your Bibles that Psalm 139 is composed and comprised of 24 different verses. They, they're really in four different sets of six verses each. And in each of them, David ascribes great worship to God for his attributes. In verses 1 through 6, which you can study later, he acknowledges that God is omniscient. That God knows everything. But you'll notice in those verses it blows David's mind that this all-knowing, omniscient God knows me. Then in verses 7 through 12, he mentions that God is omnipresent. Where can I flee from your presence? He rhetorically asks, and the obvious answer is nowhere. You cannot get away from the presence of God. God is everywhere. But the thing that blows David's mind about this omnipresent God is not merely that God is everywhere, but that God is always with me. In verses 18 or 19 through 24, he mentions that God is omnibenevolent, that God loves everyone. But the thing that really amazes him is not merely that God loves everybody, but that God loves me. 
And in the six verses set before us today, verses 13 through 18, he, he, he mentions that God is omnipotent. That is that God is all-powerful, that God can do anything and God can do everything. But the thing that blows his mind is that God in his all-powerfulness, if I could make up that word today, that God in his great power can make human beings. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Now from these six verses set before us today, I want you to consider with me three things about the power of God demonstrated in his creation of humankind. First, David is amazed, and we should be amazed. He says, God, you created me. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God, you created me. Years ago, I saw the bumper sticker that said, I know I'm somebody because God don't make no junk. (laughs) Now, your English teacher would circle that and mark that up with a red pen, but that's very good theology. That our worth, our value is found not by looking in the mirror, but by looking into the heavens and looking into the Word of God. David here reveals in this text he has more sense 3,000 years ago than the Christ-rejecting, Bible-rejecting biologists of our day. He recognizes that he was fashioned and created in the image of the Creator. God, you created me. Now, in verses 13 and 14, there are three aspects of this that I want you to note with me first. is the crafting by my master. Verse 13, for you formed my inward parts. The old King's English says, you have possessed my reins. The new King James, from which our memory work is done, says you form my inward parts. But literally, he says you created my internal organs. You created me. Think about it. The God who spoke light into existence. The God who spoke the cosmos into being. The God who spoke and things that were not began to be did not speak man into existence. But the God who said, and it was, and said, and it was, and said, and it was, when it came to creating Adam with his own hands scooped into the dust of the earth, fashioned a man according to the book of Genesis in his own image, And this creator God breathed into that man's nostrils the very breath of life. And then from his flesh created a woman and brought the woman to the man. And the man said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You and I are literally the product of the handiwork of God. The crafting by our master, yes, God certainly uses the the procreative process. Yes, he brings together a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. But understand this, that is the work of Almighty God. Early in our parenting journey, my wife and I determined that we would give our children age-appropriate truth. That we would never lie to them because we didn't think they were old enough to understand the truth. But we would give them an age-appropriate rendering of truth. So when we had a three-year-old and a five-year-old and one in the womb. And the older children asked, how did the baby get in mommy's tummy? We said, God put the baby there. That's age-appropriate truth. You understand, I can give a more detailed answer than that. I can, if I need to, give a more graphic answer than that. I could give a more biological answer than that. Are you with me? You'll never give a more truthful answer than that. God put that baby in the womb, for you formed my inward parts. 
Now, I'm going to discipline myself this morning in the interest of time and not preach a sanctity of human life sermon right here, but I promise you I could. I could take some time today and tell you I wouldn't vote for a dog catcher that believed it was right to take the life of an unborn child. But I'm not going to talk about that this morning. I could take some time and tell you that a person that does not understand that life begins at the very moment of fertilization and conception and that a person that does not understand that is scientifically ignorant and biblically immature. But I'm not going to spend time pointing that out this morning. If I had time, I would mention that God is the opener and the closer of the womb and that He is the giver and the sustainer of life. But I don't want to take time preaching on that this morning. I'm going to preach the sermon I brought. Now, I could take some time and tell you that Jeremiah 1, 5, God said to the prophet that before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. But I feel like I'd get sidetracked on a different message if I took time to point that out this morning. So I'm just going to stay in Psalm 139. He says, for you formed my inward parts. This means that even though God used his moms and dads in this obvious process... God is the one who makes the baby in the womb. Now someone in the room today, maybe watching online, needs to hear this. God crafted you in the womb of your mother irrespective of the circumstances of your conception. You may have been conceived in sin, but God made you. You may have been conceived in hatred, Anger, violence, and rape. But God made you. You may not even know who your earthly daddy is, but your heavenly Father has set His affection upon you And your worth in the sight of God is not based on the circumstances that surrounded your conception. But you were formed in the womb of your mother by a powerful God who loved you before the foundation of the world. God, you created me. That means you're no accident. You might have even heard your parents say you were an oops baby. What that means is that your mom and daddy weren't planning you at the time that God was planning you, but they didn't get to overrule God. You're not an accident. God crafted you. Your heavenly Father made you. David says, God, you created me. He mentions the crafting by my master. In verse 14, we move on and we, we, we hear the confession from the mouth. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This is one of several verses in the Bible that connects the creative power of God with our obligation to praise and worship Him. That, that means when we sang a few moments ago, Did did you stand like a wooden Indian? Were you silent while the saints of God praised the God of the saints? Well, the Bible says, I will praise you if for no other reason. You made me. Now, we could say, I ought ought to praise God for all he's done for me. Amen goes right there. I praise God for all He's given me, for all of His blessings. I I praise God that He saved me by His grace and forgave my sin. That'd be reason to praise the Lord forever. But here we find one of several places in the Bible that we are to praise God if for no other reason He's our Creator. Psalm 95 says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. And Revelation 4 Heaven worships God, declaring, Thou art worthy 
to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and by your will and for your pleasure they exist. Now let's just be practical for a moment. If I were to make you some dessert, for example, my world-famous carrot cake, and if I were to bring that by your house and ask you if I could have a slice of it before I left, doesn't it make sense that since I made it and gave it to you, you ought to be willing to give me a little bit of it back? God gave you your body. He asked for a little service in return. God gave you your breath. He asked for worship in return. God gave you your mouth. He asked for praise in return. And it is only right that we kneel before the Lord, our Maker. David said, in light of the fact you've made me, I will praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We read in these verses, the crafting by my master, the confession from my mouth. Note also the consideration of my mind. Again in Psalm 139 verse 14, marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. You see, David is finding his value and his worth not in himself, but in his God. I believe I'll say that again. David is finding his value and his worth not in himself, but in his God. I don't know if you were watching the World Series this past week, but uh, man, one of the Atlanta Braves hit a baseball literally slap out of the park. And I was reading on the internet that some people who were watching from an apartment little little balcony you know ledge they were trying to strain to catch a little free world series baseball they saw that ball bounce down onto the street amazingly nobody came to get it and so from what i believe was the eighth or ninth floor they finally went down and and went and found that baseball they were astros fans and so when first interviewed the guy said he thought about burning it Then somebody suggested it might be worth a million dollars. He said, I'm not going to burn it. (laughs) You could buy that regulation World Series baseball on Amazon.com literally for about $15 a piece. But somebody's put a mark on that baseball. And now it's worth so much more. Now scientists debate about the value of of the actual physical body. I mean, if we were to turn you into just fat and, and all of the things that physically make up the human body, most of the time I see it estimated that, that we are physically worth less than a dollar. But yet we've been fearfully and wonderfully made by God. God has stamped His divine image upon us. And David does not say... I'm wonderful. I'm fearful. He says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Not marvelous am I. Marvelous are you and your works. By the way, this is what separates what I'm preaching today from the pop psychology smiling preachers you find on most of Christian television. Who want to tell you how wonderful you are, how great you are, that you ought to claim who you are and name it and claim it and blab it and grab it. Look look at this statement on the screen. The problem with self-image, self-esteem and self-worth is the self. But through a biblical worldview, we find our worth in the glory of the Creator, a glory which the creation itself clearly reveals. That my value is not found by looking into the mirror, but by looking into the face of God as revealed in His Word. Now what this means, and listen carefully, this means your value and your worth is great even though you may not look like everyone else. Your child may not even be like everyone else. They may have six fingers instead of ten 
one hand instead of two. Your child's brain may not function like all the other boys and girls at their school. Their chromosomes may not line up like most people's. But your worth is not established by your worth. But in the worthiness of the one who created you, crafted you, and set his seal and his divine image upon you. David ascribes glory to God because God, you created me. Let's say this verse together again as they place it on the screen. Read it. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. Psalm 139 14. He says, God, you created me. Secondly, God, you consider me. There's an old saying in politics and business that it's not what you know, but who you know. And that may be true in those arenas. But the truth is, it's not important what you know or who you know, but who knows you. Earlier in this psalm, David mentions the omniscience of God. That God knows everything. But here, he picks up that pen again to talk about the fact that God knows everything about him. And God knows everything about you. And God knows everything about me. And I want to say along with David from Psalm 8, when I consider, Lord, who you are and all the powerful things that you have created, and I consider who I am and all the things that I have done, what is man that you are mindful of him? He gives honor and glory to God, that God, you consider me. Now in verses 15 and 16, I just want you to see three things about the consideration of God. First, he mentions your watch over my life. Your watch over my life. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. This is a poetic metaphor describing the womb of David's mother. Long before ultrasound and sonogram technology, David said, when I was just what the scientists today would call a zygote, when I, when I was unseeable to the naked human eye, your eyes saw my unformed substance. Verse 16, verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you. God, you have been watching over me since before my mom and daddy even knew I was to arrive. I do not know the circumstances that brought you into this room today. I would not pretend to even try to give a list of all the challenges that you may be facing because of death or disease or abandonment, because of financial trouble or relational crises, but I do know this, it has not caught your heavenly Father by surprise. He sees you, He watches over you, He knows every intimate detail of your life. Someone has said that God is like a middle schooler. You can't tell Him anything because He already knows it all. God certainly does already know everything. And it's this all-knowing God that is watching over your life. He mentions your watch over my life. Also, he mentions your weaving of my life. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Now, the King James here uses the word curiously, when I was curiously wrought. The New King James says when I was skillfully wrought. Now, when we use the word curious or curiously, we usually think that it's somebody that's kind of inquisitive. You know, curiosity killed the cat. Or we might use the word curious to describe someone that's just a little bit odd. Like Brother Lynn is a curious fellow, isn't he? Yeah. And by the way, if curious means odd, I see some of you that God curiously wrought in the womb of your mother. But no, this word indeed means intentionally 
painstakingly done with accuracy and attention to detail. It's a continuation of the, of the thought in the previous verses of being knit together. In fact, this word for curiously or skillfully is a word that is drawn from the world of needlepoint. Cross stitch. Tapestry. Now, you young kids probably don't even know what that is. You senior adults, if you know what I'm talking about, nod at me. Every stitch exactly the way the maker wanted it to be. Every little jot, every little bit exactly like the maker wanted it to be. And David dips his inspired pen into the ink of God's vocabulary and doesn't merely say, you put me together. He doesn't merely say, you made me. But it's as if he's sitting at the weaver's shuttle watching a tapestry being put together. And he says, that's what God did with me. Every small detail of God creating even my physical body is exactly how God wanted it to be. Now lean in close and listen to the heart of your pastor. When you look in the mirror, you may not feel that way about your own physical body. Be careful you do not criticize the handiwork of God. You are exactly how God created you. I'm talking about your tendencies, your propensities. I'm not suggesting that that it's wrong to do the best you can with what you have. In other words, I don't think you sin by having an appointment with Miss Clairol. The old preachers used to say, if the barn needs a coat of paint, paint the barn. I didn't say that. I'm quoting the old preachers. <laughs> this is not to say that we should not exercise, try to eat right, take care of our physical bodies. It is not to say that there are not sins that we can commit by neglecting those very spiritual disciplines. But it is to say that God made your eyes. God made your nose. God made the shape of your head. God even gave you the genetic predispositions related to weight. Some of you can gain weight by just looking at the the flashing hot sign at Krispy Kreme. I burn calories sitting down watching the ball game. Some of you struggle to lose weight. I've got striped pajamas with one stripe. (laughs) You may wish you were taller, wish that you were shorter, wish you were smaller, wish that you were bigger, wish you had more of this or less of that. I just want to remind you this morning, according to the Word of God, God physically wove you together the way that He wants you to be. Andrea and I, as you know, are blessed with four children. They range from age nine to soon be 19. And that means over the last almost two decades, our refrigerator has been the Museum of Childhood Art. You know when your kids, some of you, your grandkids bring you a picture and you ask them to explain it to you, you say, oh, tell me all about it. What you really are asking is, what in the world is this supposed to be? So that when they say, well, that's a picture of our house and the car and the dog, you go, well, of course it is. Imagine that you are so proud of that little picture and you put it up on the refrigerator and a neighbor comes over and they begin to criticize something your child has done. Tell the truth. You're going to be a little bit offended, aren't you? You might even tell them that the same door that brought them in will take them out. (laughs) Be careful when you stand in front of the mirror. And criticize the handiwork of God. David says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. And then he says, I was skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. 
Students, boys and girls, I want you to listen very attentively. This is a theological reason why you should never bully or criticize someone for their physical appearance. And it's so easy to do. Mom and dad, we remember it's so easy to do when you're on the bus or you're on the playground. And everyone starts jumping on and criticizing the one kid that's a little bit different. Maybe they're overweight. Maybe they're not athletic. Maybe their face looks like they're a poster child for clear seal, whatever it may be. It's so easy to jump on that bandwagon. But I want to tell you something. You're not just criticizing the creation. You are criticizing the Creator. And God takes that very, very seriously. David says, God, you consider me. Your watch over me, your weaving of me, and then your will for my life. Verse 16, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Look at this. And in your book, they all were written. What was written? The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. David is overwhelmed to think that this great God who knows the number of hairs on his head who knows the thoughts in his mind, who knows the words in his mouth, even before they get out of his mouth, also knows the number of his days and that God has a will for his life. We can often criticize the evangelistic plan that begins, God has a wonderful plan for your life. And rightly so in many ways. It sounds so man-centered. But let us not forget God does have a great plan for your life. And He has established it in His book. And if you will follow Him, listen to His voice, and study and follow and obey His Word, then God's will for your life will unfold in His own providential time. The bottom line is that God created you. He knows you. And He created you for a purpose. Generally speaking and universally speaking, that plan is that we enjoy Him and bring Him glory. But the greatest enjoyment and fulfillment you will have in your life is to simply ask God, what is it that you want me to do? Where is it you want me to live? What is it that you want me to be? David says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God, you created me. God, you consider me. And then in the last two verses of our text, God, you care for me. The idea that God cares for us. Like like probably every parent in the building, I love my children. Amen? Now, I do not always love what they do. Thank you, Brother Andrew. Feel a kindred spirit there. Everybody else, their kids always behave. I always love my kids, but I don't always love what they do. God does not always approve of what we do, but God loves His children. How amazing it is that the one who knows us the best loves us the most. Now, last month during Pastor Appreciation Month, you you so beautifully poured out your love upon me and upon our family. And I'm so grateful. But I'm keenly aware that some of you love me because you don't know me as well as you think you do. And that if you knew the real me, you might not walk across the street to listen to me give a silent prayer. (laughs) David says the, the, the God who knows everything about me still loves me and cares for me. Three things as we close. How does God demonstrate this love? Well, first, He says, you sought for me. Verse 17, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. Now, this word precious is a very interesting word. It could be translated as costly. Think about precious metals are costly metals. Precious stones are costly Stones, precious jewels are costly jewels. And the Spirit of God moves through David's hand to say, How costly is your love or your thoughts toward me? 
The idea here is that God loved him so much that God was willing to spend something to demonstrate that love. For God to love us like this doesn't just cost him something, it cost him his own son. How precious are your thoughts toward me. This is a reminder of the gospel that God, born out of nothing but his own good pleasure and his divine will to glorify himself, sent his son into the world. And Christ died on the cross, rose in power and victory, ascended back to the right hand of God the Father from where he will return in victory at any moment. Not because we're wonderful, but because he is wonderful. Now, you need to have that straight in your mind. God did not do that because we are lovable, but because He is love. Not because we're great, but because He's great. Not because we're worth saving, but because He's a great Savior. And this thought blows David's mind that a God who knows Him better than He knows Himself sought after Him. Through Christ. He says you sought for me. Also he says you see about me. Verse 17. How precious also are your thoughts to me O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them they would be more in number than the sand. Now I told the early service that in restudying this passage this week. This is the part of the text that really blew my mind. I guess it's because all of the other doctrinal truths, they're just really settled in my mind. It was not revelation to me that God created us and knit us together in our mother's womb. But I am regularly overwhelmed every time I come to this passage that he says, How precious are your thoughts toward me. How vast is the number of them. God's thoughts toward me. If I counted up the number of times, God, that you're thinking about me, they would outnumber the sand. Now, throughout the Bible, we see regular times that we're to have God on our mind. Psalm 1, describing the blessed man, says that his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law, the, the, the blessed man meditates day and night. That, that we're blessed if we are constantly thinking about the Word of God and the God of that Word. We are told in everything we ought to give thanks. So the goodness of God should always be on our mind. The Bible clearly teaches us that we'll be blessed if God is always at the forefront of our mind. But here the tables are turned. And he says, God, I'm always at the forefront of your mind. If I counted up the number of times during the day that you think about me, that number would be greater than the sands of the, of the sea or the stars in the sky. God, you see about me. Now, I cannot overemphasize this fact. Again, God's constant thoughts about us are not because we're wonderful, but because He is. If you were to walk in my office and see my office plastered with pictures of my wife and my kids, you would, by the way. You don't generally say, what a great wife, what wonderful kids. You say, what a loving husband and a caring father. And in the same way, when we consider that God is always thinking about us, it doesn't say much about us. It says much about our God. That you sought for me. You see about me. And finally, that you stay with me. Our text for the morning ends in verse 18. When I am awake, I am still with you. Again, elsewhere in this psalm, David talks about God's omnipresence, that God is everywhere. But here we see it is not merely theological. It's not just in the abstract or the theoretical. But that God is always with him. Take comfort in that, dear child of God. Whether you're at the hospice house, or the funeral home, or the hospital, the divorce lawyer's office, when you've been called up to the school, when the doctor calls and you're alone at home 
hearing that there's a spot on the x-ray and they need to run more tests. Whatever life throws your way, God Himself is with you. He says, even when I am awake, I am still with you. Someone asked the little boy, is your God really big or really small? And the little boy said both. <laughs> big enough to be everywhere, small enough to be inside my heart. One of my favorite hymns was written not long after the close of the Civil War. In the 1880s, a Swedish hymn writer was describing the greatness of God. It's one of the most popular hymns of all time, How Great Thou Art. And if you read and study the lyrics of that great song of worship, he's moved by what he sees and by what he hears. You know the song. He He sees the stars and the worlds thy hands have made. And he he hears the thunder. He walks through the forest. He sees the forest glades. He hears the birds singing sweetly in the trees. He he sees the lofty mountain grandeur. He hears the, the babbling of the brook. And what he sees and what he hears makes him say, How great thou art. I think we would do well to walk outside and look and listen to the sights and sounds of nature, but you can do something a whole lot easier than that. You can hold your hand up in front of your face and contemplate the fact that you can move your fingers and that your eyes are able to see that movement and messages are sent to your brain to know exactly what's happening. Or you can walk across the hall after this service And look through the doorway into the nursery at the beauty of an infant and hear their cry. And you will have to cry out how great thou art. That's really what David is saying in this month's memory work. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website, at ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emmanuel Pulpit.